Oh, no, look how my garden of roses. Let's spend some time talking about California's upcoming elections and why the left keeps losing. The Washington Post this morning started with a front page article proclaiming that California will be pushing further to the left in its politics with its gubernatorial and congressional elections. With Jerry Brown, the popular left wing governor, retiring, and a ballot that at this point lacks any serious right wing contenders for any of the positions, and a growing youth vote that is exceedingly left wing and in many cases outright socialist. The two contenders for each position who will come out of the primaries this year are extremely likely to both be Democrats or Democratic Socialists. If you were to look at those competing for the positions at this point, you'd have a remarkably clear picture of why the Democrats keep losing in the United States, even if they're able to hold such a stronghold in California and other devoutly blue states. Their ranks are filled to the brim with wealthy and corrupt liberal and centrist Republican elites pandering to this youth vote with their money with little to no actual concern for the positions which they espouse. There does not appear to be a single person on the Democratic side of the open races right now with much concern for the $425 billion of debt that the state currently holds. Rather, touting the state's $465 billion in state revenue is evidence of how well the state is doing, despite the yearly expenditures of the state exceeding $566 billion, a number that is expected to grow in the coming year. Currently making up the ranks of the contenders for governor are six very wealthy individuals, four running on the Democratic ticket and two running as Republicans. Gavin Newsom, Lieutenant Governor of California and avowed pro-business Democrat and unabashed progressive, has long had a history of controversy, including is issuing illegal marriage licenses, being cuckolded by the mayor of San Francisco as well as his own campaign manager, and has been groomed by Governor Jerry Brown himself to carry on the failures of the incumbency. Based on his record, he will support anything that gets him votes, even if it drives California further into debt and divides the state further along party lines. Antonio Villaraigosa, Speaker of the Assembly and former Mayor of Los Angeles, has a long history of lobbying for a company named Herbalife, a pyramid scheme that was just last year forced to pay out millions in damages by the FCC, though at this point they are struggling to actually pay those and having to go back to courts. Despite this, Villaraigosa is the only Democratic contender who has even acknowledged that California has a working class, Th uh, though his focus appears to be entirely on blue-collar Latinos, whether they're legal citizens and residents or not. John Xiang, current state treasurer, is well known to have provided tax credits and bonds to individual housing developers who assisted in his political campaigns over the last years. Delane Easton's record as superintendent of schools in California shows a long history of ignoring corruption in the grandly wasted $20 million of federal funds which were supposed to be allocated for creating community organizations and edu educating immigrant children in the English language, even being held personally liable for $1.4 million in non-economic damages related to that situation. John Cox, one of the two Republican candidates and wealthy venture capitalist from Chicago who has thrice failed to win gubernatorial bids and fell quite short in his presidential bid in 2008, is a powerful lobbying force in California, having moved the, uh, the state to repeal gas tax increases as well as other taxes. And Travis Allen, a conservative assemblyman from Huntington Beach, was the only candidate I can find without any publicized controversies about him, other than the sheer hate that he receives from those outside his constituency for having voted for Trump. He is a wealthy financier and wealth manager in his own right, and shows in his six years as assemblyman for Orange County a very populist position, and in recent months has been a lone voice supporting the enforcement of law, especially immigration law. 
Despite the Republican candidates John Cox and Travis Allen being the least controversial of the lot, the divided rebel Republican ticket only poses to hurt both of them in the long run as they compete against each other for California's Republican voters, which means it is extremely unlikely likely at this point that either candidate will make it past the primaries, leaving only a very corrupt set of Democrats to remain as the two candidates for governor, of which one will undoubtedly be the Lieutenant Governor Devin Newsom, who is to Ger Governor Jerry Brown what Mike Pence is to Donald Trump, a wealthy, silver spoon-fed member of the elite who stands further to the extreme than the man for whom he works. And while the senatorial list appears more diverse, including people with no more political history than having published a book or served as ombudsman, the limitless terms of the Senate and House in the United States does not bode well for any of those candidates, meaning California is bound for more of the same, if not greater movement to the left under severely progressive gubernatorial leadership. Leadership with almost no concern for the balance of law between the federal and state governments, and almost no concern for the dwindling wealth of the individual and the greater and greater tax cuts put upon the working class structure which keeps California functioning. Sargon had it quite correct yesterday when he described the left both in the UK and the United States as bourgeoisie. It's this disregard for the working class, this outright disdain for anyone who doesn't have the wealth to live in Los Angeles or San Francisco and the time to ignore their university courses to riot in the streets against the president, which makes the sheer hypocrisy of this upcoming election rather apparent to me. With a strong focus on young voters, overwhelmingly democratic, the politicians set to win the primaries are willing to pander with any subject they can. Whether it be supporting the fight against immigration and customs enforcement, recreating Obamacare within the states, condemning the so-called evils of white male imperialist capitalism, and more, while supporting such things only lines their already fat pockets and drives the state further into debt, further into questionable legal position with the federal government, and pushes entire swaths of cal counties in California to again demand independence from a state which is rapidly growing out of control. Aside from Travis a Allen, none of the candidates in California races appear to have any interest in the security and solvency of California or its residents, and not one will acknowledge the bubble that grows greater and greater within the Silicon Valley stronghold, which, while amounting to 30% of the stock market's growth in the last two years, holds the reins of a dangerous monopolization through mergers and acquisitions, which many very intelligent economic forecasters say stand behind the current plummeting stock market value and possible bursting bubble, which we will see in the next two years. Not one is acknowledging the housing bubble in California, which strongly resembles the housing bubble of the late 2000s in the United States, which in California is growing disproportionately compared to the rest of the nation. Not one is acknowledging the severe weight that is the 4 million recipients of food stamps, 10% of its population, and nearly 1 million unemployed in California. The only thing these elite in California wish to see is their utopian dream coming true, without ever considering why stories of utopia have been written, as a warning to the dangers of that illusion. And just as current Governor Jerry Brown popular as he may be predicted last year, the state is going to see a tax crash in the next year or two. And when it does, it will take 39 million taxpaying citizens and their families with it. But do these candidates for governor care? Not in the slightest. They only care about the youth vote and the money they can skim off the top before that tax crash comes. This is why the left keeps losing. They can't acknowledge their own corruption is also the demise of their constituencies. And the fact of the matter comes down to California, while predominantly under the age of 30, is great for voting if you're Democrat, but terrible for working. 
there are severely limited jobs available in California, especially if you're not trained as a programmer or an engineer or someone who can work in Los Angeles or San Francisco. There is extremely high taxes placed on farms. There are extremely high taxes placed on the lower class while capital gains is fixed at 10%, promoting the growth of these companies like Google and Microsoft. And every day, the state grows deeper and deeper into debt. You can actually go out and find uh, state debt calculators, which show an active tally of debts of new, of new uh, food stamp recipients as they're updated, uh, of the GDP, of the expenditures, the entirety, and the state is rapidly approaching a point where it is completely unsustainable. And this isn't only acknowledged by me. This is acknowledged repeatedly and has been over the last year by Californians themselves, stating that unless they can raise taxes to a total of t by a total of 20 billion, they are going to be completely unable to pay off any of their expenditures necessary. And that will lead to a severe crash in the upcoming, in the next couple of years. They won't be able to afford paying for food stamps. They won't be able to afford paying for other uh, welfare and support structures. They're not going to be able to do any of the things necessary. And the state is essentially going to go into free fall. What are companies like Google and Microsoft and other giants in Silicon Valley going to do then? Well, I can tell you pretty clearly what they're going to do because they started doing it years ago. They're going to move. And they're not the only ones that are going to move. So are the immigrants. It's already been shown that immigrants go to where the money is. And if California reaches a point where they cannot pay these uh, welfare systems, they're in turn going to move to Washington or Colorado or Texas or Florida. And when they do, California loses a large chunk of its voter base. This is one of the few things that actually looks good for California, because in losing that voter base, they actually open California up to... Forgive me. They actually open California up to have conservatives actually fix some of the things wrong with the state. Not to say that the conservatives would be much better as far as corruption goes, although currently those running for office have a much better track record, if not politically, certainly financially. And even if I may be against the severe uh, influx of lobbying and its influence over government, at least they would have the money in their pockets to be able to move the government and perhaps stabilize California somewhat, preventing it from becoming an enormous Alabama at that point. And this is exactly why I say that the left keeps losing, because if you're not going to show concern for all of your citizens, all of your residents, you're going to end up in a situation where the people to whom you're pandering to can't get what they're asking for even if you promised it and your campaign promises turn into campaign lies and while you sit on top of a mountain of money that you gain skimming off the top of federal and state investitures such as education grants and the like and everyone else around you is starving well they're going to turn around and they're going to riot against you. If you keep pushing these people to be riotous and chaotic in their nature, making them all these promises that you can't keep, eventually the starving masses are going to turn on you because you've held them up with a pack of lies. And this pack of lies is what keeps the left afloat, but only barely. And soon we're going to be seeing 
the grand divisions in the left all across the country, as well as in California alone, shatter. And new things are going to have to come out of them. Otherwise, it's going to be an economic freefall across the country due to the collapse of California. Now, I'm probably going to be talking about this economic bubble that I brought up in this, uh, in this video quite a bit more in the upcoming days because I really think it's something that we need to discuss. It's extremely important in my mind that we address what economists, some economists have been calling the everything bubble that's not only related to the United States but around the world. With Canada having a housing bubble which is nearly double the impact that the, um, the housing bubble in the United States had in 2007, with uh, Germany cooking its books to maintain trade surplus over every nation in the EU as well as America, with China constantly manipulating uh, uh, foreign exchange and trade and maintaining their own form of trade surplus and trade control. The current system cannot hold, and I hope you'll look forward to that because, as depressing as it may be, it's important to understand where we stand economically. The world may look better financially, the states may look better financially, California may look better financially, but that is just very temporary, that is horribly inflated, and it is at the heart of the problems that are going to be showing up in the next two years. Thank you for listening, and I will catch you next time. Mm -hmm.